So uh, the, the title, as it says, I would point out is not metaphorical. This is about an, the, an actual use for a real cardboard box to receive radio signals from the moon. Uh, this is part of a broader series of talks and demonstrations I'm doing on amateur radio. Uh, I won't repeat the entire introduction today, other than to say there's a great Wikipedia article. Uh, this is the sort of conventional symbol for amateur radio. Uh, something's gone wrong. Give me a moment, please. I should be able to see what is happening. Press that. Slideshow. Uh, everything's fine, just I haven't got the usual presenter display. Never mind. Um, so, but very briefly, Amateur Radio is a radio communication service, but it's specifically for uh, things that are about personal motivations rather than what you're doing for your employer. The definition is used in most English-speaking jurisdictions. It's been used for about half a century. I would suggest it looks an awful lot like a definition of the maker movement, except for the bit about radio. That is, it's self-training, it's not for profit, it's sort of engineering for fun. Uh, I resumed my involvement in radio about two years ago. I first did this when I was a kid. And the question for me at the time was, you know, why do it? The internet and smartphones have kind of eliminated the, the traditional use of amateur radio. What's the point anymore? And so I identified four different areas where amateur radio was interesting. To operate where the mobile network goes away, uh, this is particularly in natural disaster type scenarios. Louisiana went underwater. You know, the mobile network stops working, and the roads are underwater, so engineers can't get out and fix it. Uh, operating places where the network doesn't exist. Uh, rural and desert areas are an obvious case. Uh, space is the other, which is my area of interest. The DIY radio electronics uh, very much interests me. I've been playing with electronics since I was seven years old, and so this as an application of electronics is fascinating. And not so much for my, myself, but for many people, the ability to operate at increased power. Uh, amateurs can operate in the sort of high hundreds or low kilowatts, uh, which is useful for communicating very long distances on the, on the Earth's surface using the ionosphere as both a duct and a, a mirror. Um, amateurs have been involved in space right from the beginning, and I do mean the beginning. Um, in 57, hello, I do apologize, my presenter mode just isn't working. In 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, the first person in the Western world to detect Sputnik was not part of a university or a military organization or of any governmental organization. It was a ham operating out of his basement in West Germany. He later went on to, f to establish the Bochum Observatory, and I'll come back to it later. But yeah, it just it happens that Westerners weren't looking at the time, so it was a ham who picked it up first. Um, hams were involved right at the beginning of the space race. So in 1961, when the first cosmonauts and astronauts uh, went to orbit, December that year, Oscar 1, orbiting satellite carrying amateur radio, uh, went into orbit. It hitched a free ride on, of course, a CIA rocket. I'm perfectly serious. Um, <laughs> and so that was the, the first of the amateur satellites. There have now been uh, dozens or low hundreds of satellites carrying amateur traffic one way or another. It's an ongoing thing. There are probably 30-odd operating today. Uh, one is the ISS. This has not only an amateur station on board, but also an amateur repeater. And more than half of the astronauts, and I believe also the cos cosmonauts who serve on the ISS, are in fact licensed amateurs and use it to talk to friends and family uh, from orbit. So I haven't yet got around to doing it because it's the wrong time zone. The astronauts operate on London time, so to cat and they usually do amateur radio after work. So think three in the morning, four in the morning our time. I, I will get to it at some point. Um, another interesting variant is satellites that were built for a different purpose. So these are EO79 and 80, the European Space Agency satellites that had a sort of paid science mission first and in sort of in return for being allowed to use amateur spectrum, then made these satellites available for amateur use for the entire rest of their lifetimes. So they spend six to, six to 12 months doing their science mission and then sort of five to 10 years providing amateur service. So there's, there's quite a few different ways that amateur satellite capacity 
uh, comes into being. They're not all fully amateur-funded satellites. Um, to talk to these low-Earth orbit satellites, so the ISS, the EOs, uh, you don't need terribly complicated equipment. In some cases, you can do it with a handheld, handheld antenna. And in fact, if you look at the, uh, the bases of the antennas just in front of my head, they actually have nice foam handles. These are, these are antennas designed for handheld use with a handheld radio. In this case, I've got a pair of them to solve a, a polarization problem and a little metal box in the middle that has motors in it that steers to, to follow low Earth orbit satellites as they cross the sky. They cross quickly. 15 minutes is typical. And so, yeah, it gets exhausting to keep pointing while you're talking. Um, so, the, I've forgotten the sequence of the story, but uh, a satellite that was launched in 2000 mm -hmm. called AO40, Amateur Oscar 40, had intended to use what's called a Molniya orbit. This was something invented by the Russians because they had a need to serve uh, the very northern latitudes. And so you take three satellites with this very elliptical orbit that's fairly tight around the southern hemisphere and a, a long way out, 60, 65, 70,000 kilometers uh, at the northern hemisphere. And it has about 12 hours of exposure on each orbit. So just three of these is enough to provide round the clock coverage for the entire Earth north of about 40 degrees latitude. And so for the Soviet Union, this was a very useful tool. So AO40 decided to attempt to get into a Molniya orbit, Molniya orbit rather. Um, it failed, and so it ended up in this uh, entirely different orbit to what was planned. But, and again, so this is not like commercial service. There's a whole lot of random stuff going on. I'll come back to AO40 later, but I'll, I raise it now because it will be important in the story to give you a sense of where it is. It's not in low Earth orbit. It was only operating for five years, between four years, between 2000 and 2004, but it's in this very elliptical and very high orbit. Oh, well, outside of geostationary, in fact. So quite a long way out. Um, my end objective is to bounce radio signals off the moon. Uh, this is a bit difficult. <laughs> it's three quarters of a million kilometers round trip. And so it's not just radio, it's cryogenics, it's signal processing, and a whole bunch of other things that all have to work at the same time for this to work. I, this is a multi-year project, and that's okay. I will sort of keep playing with related stuff as steps towards. And that's part of actually how the thing with the cardboard box came about. I was looking for an intermediate project. Uh, before I get into what I'm doing, just a quick survey of other cool things that amateurs have done or are doing in space. Uh, during the Apollo program, when second-hand TV dishes were not available cheaply, this gentleman built himself a stressed hyperbola dish. So it's not a parabola, it's, a, it's straight beams that are then stretched using fishing line, but it's near enough to provide a, a focused beam and was actually able to listen in to the capsule communications for the Apollo program. The deal was, yes, it's fine for amateurs to be listening, no, you can't record it or reproduce it. So it's an interesting way. Of, in Singapore, it's like if it's not broadcast, you're not allowed to listen to it. In the US, it was like, fine, you got us, but you can't reproduce it. So they got to listen, but we, you know, the official recordings are NASA's. Um, one thing that's generally fairly easy, actually, is to listen to Jupiter. Jupiter is the most powerful source of, of um, HF radio emissions in the solar system, even more so than the sun. And so with a bit of wire about eight meters long and a sensitive receiver, you can, in fact, listen to radio noise emitted by Jupiter. At the other extreme, and I mentioned the Bochum Observatory, founded by the guy who happened to hear uh, Sputnik. In 2006, a bunch of amateurs were able to detect Voyager's signal. At that point, it was already past Pluto. It was 10 billion kilometers. So this is, you know, you know I think a quarter of a million kilometers is hard. There, there are people doing even harder things. In fact, these guys have gone further. Um, they then set about bouncing radio signals off Venus. It's five million kilometers away. Uh, in 2009. That's beyond what I expect ever to attempt. Um, apparently, they're a fairly ambitious group, so they've set their sights even higher, um, not to bounce signals off Mars, which apparently would be too easy, but to build this object and put it in orbit around Mars. They're not kidding. How they'll arrange a ride, not yet clear. But as I said, amateurs have, been putting, have put dozens of satellites into orbit, including in some fairly high orbits. Can we get a ride to Mars? Well, time will tell. Um, if they succeed, uh, they will win this revolting object. Um, this was a cup created in 1929. 
uh, Hiram Percy Maxim, who's, who's the, very much the sort of father of the amateur radio movement in the US, was also fascinated by Mars. And so he established a prize, which is just the cup, there's no cash, um, for the first uh, amateurs who established two-way communication with Mars. Any uh, details, up to you. So the AMSAT, it's the AMSAT Germany group who's doing this, and they actually expect to succeed, at least within our lifetimes. Quite how, whether that's uh, five years or 20 years away, I don't know. Um, on the, in, more in the sort of uh, projects that have succeeded, this is IC3. Uh, it was a satellite launched in the, or probe launched in the 70s. It was placed in a location called Earth Sun L1 to observe the sun. It was then retasked to rendezvous with a comet. It was then retasked again to rendezvous with a second comet. So it's both the first spacecraft ever to rendezvous with a comet and the first and only to rendezvous with two. It was part of the, the posse of uh, probes that chased Halley in 1986. Um, by about 97, NASA was like, OK, we're finished. We have nothing more useful to do with this spacecraft. So they gifted it to the Smithsonian in orbit. It's in orbit around the sun, and it intersects the Earth every 15 to 20 years, approximately. So in about 2010, <laughs> more than a decade after its last command was sent by NASA, a bunch of people, who I assume are college students, thought, huh, IC3 will intersect with Earth in about 2014. We should reactivate it. And so with the help of the Smithsonian and NASA and the Arecibo Observatory, who lent them the world's biggest dish, uh, and some radio manufacturers who lent them software-defined radios, um, this small team actually put together a project to regain control of the craft, to fire its engines once to get it into a stabilizing spin. Unfortunately, they then weren't able to make the additional firings to put it back into its original mission. But this, of course, required not only orbital mechanics and spacecraft operations, but radio. Right? The reason for the use of the Arecibo dish was to have this very weak signal communication with a spacecraft that at the time was a, a long way away. And so this is kind of an extreme example, but it's what people who are playing with this stuff for fun can and have achieved. So uh, getting back to what I'm doing, my problem for, for choosing smaller projects and sort of small steps towards the larger one, is low Earth orbit's pretty easy and can be done with handheld gear and can be simplified, at least operationally, by having an automated tracker, which I built earlier this year. Uh, geostationary and Molnir are anything up to whatever there's thousands of times that distance, but with suitable dishes and, and some fiddling, it's doable. But to get from, and setting aside that there are no Molnir orbit or, or currently any amateur geostationary orbits, although there will be in about 18 months, um, getting from 60,000 kilometers to 750,000 kilometers in one step is a bit um, <laughs> horrifying. It's, it's quite a difficult thing to do. I was like, well, you know, wouldn't it be nice if there was at least one intermediate step? But there can't be because there are no operating radio transmitters on the moon, which is literally true, but misleading. There's an operating radio transmitter in orbit around the moon. This is the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It's in the process of doing some square meter photographs of the entire surface of the moon. It has two downlinks. One of them's on S-band, which is pretty close to Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So the equipment is readily available. Not necessarily cheap, but readily available. So I, when I realized this, I thought, oh, hey, this is still operating. Surely somebody has gone to look for it. And the answer is two people have gone to look for it. One using a 60 centimeter satellite dish, uh, one using a 90 centimeter Wi Fi point to point dish. But they're both, because of the frequencies, they're both about right. Um, fairly similar stats. So the dishes are comparable size, they're both optimized at about the same frequency, very similar gain. Uh, 21, 22 decibels is, uh, is approximately 100 to 1. So instead of listening to the whole sky, they're listening to a, a hundredth, about a 15 by 15 degree uh, cone, if you like. Um, some differences in approach. The OZ9AC guy used a 1,000 to 1 low noise amplifier without any frequency conversion, which means he needs some fairly fancy coax. It turns out that the standard coax that we use for most radio is useless at 2.4 gig because you just the, the losses in the coax are immense. Um, the Gateway guy basically sort of ordered random gear off Alibaba and then messed around for a while and got it to work, 
was using uh, a low noise block and down converter for satellite TV. Um, and then just cheap coax and RTL SDR, the standard dongles. And again, because the, the down conversion had occurred, the frequency was in a range that a, that a $10 uh, STL dongle could talk to rather than a $1,500. Uh, universal software radio peripheral, which is the sort of Rolls Royce of software defined radios. Um, so, okay, I thought that's great. So, when I get to the point of doing that sort of stuff, this will be a useful starting project ahead of getting a three meter dish and all the other stuff required for Earth, Moon, Earth. But they're still dishes. And in Singapore, there's a regulatory problem with dishes. It's doable, but you need about three or four government agencies to all say yes at the same time. Um, and so, I will get there, but it's not where I want to start. So I thought, okay, I will shelve this as an interesting project to, as an interesting entry point once I start having those discussions with the various bodies who have to say yes. So separately, about a week later, I was reading up on AO40, this thing that tried to get to a millennial orbit and ended up in this, not quite, but this very high orbit. And um, there'd been a problem with getting hams in the US to try it, because even in 2000, hams were sort of less willing to go out and buy a dish. So someone says, well, no, no, it's microwave. You don't need a dish. You can use a horn, meaning something with flat sides, a bit like a speaker box. And the important thing about flat sides is you can literally use a cardboard box and roll it out foil. So not a metaphor, an actual cardboard box, in fact, two. And so what you're seeing here, um, so from the outside, you're seeing a cardboard box. Inside is a second box with sort of four roughly triangular pieces to make the horn. And at the back of the horn, a bit of roughly a paperclip, a bit of wire stuffed directly into the input socket on the low noise block. And so the, the low noise block and down converter are uh, sitting directly on the back of the, the cardboard box. And the, the driven element is just a bit of stiff wire in the, in the throat of the thing. So I thought, well, that's really cool. I love this. It's a sort of nice hack and good thing for hams and yada, yada, yada. And then I happened to notice the specifications. And here we've got one of the craziest uh, coincidences ever. LRO operates at 2271 megahertz. AO40 operated at 2304. They're less than 2% apart. It means I don't even have to redo the, the numbers for the, I can just make the same box. <laughs> I will redo the sums. But in principle, they're so close that you can use exactly the same equipment in both cases. But importantly, the gain is about the same. 20 dBi is about 100 fold. This is near enough the same specs as what these other two guys were using to detect LRO. So like, whoa! So I can take a cardboard box that was used to solve a problem a decade ago for AO40 and use it to detect transmissions from the moon. I've got my intermediate project now. Unless MDA decides to start regulating cardboard boxes, in which case I have a problem. But assuming not, uh, that's the approach that's available. So um, I'm taking uh, sort of a hybrid because I already have a Novena, which has a what's called a field programmable RF unit, the sort of a primary component of a software-defined radio on board, which operates all the way up to, to 3.8 gigahertz. So it will cover completely the, the frequencies involved, meaning I don't actually need a down converter. So I've taken the, the box, a low noise amplifier, a bit of rather expensive coax, and the Novena. That's the current design. Um, the amplifier is just a little box. It's sort of that big with uh, SMA connectors on both ends. Uh, the coax is ludicrously expensive, um, A, because it's um, got to have low capacitance, so it's not absorbing the signal, and B, because it's got to have good shielding, so the signal isn't escaping. A really fundamental problem, if anyone in the room has done any communications engineering, uh, the reason that superheterodyne radios were devised is because a device like this, which has a lot of gain, and the same frequency at the input and the output, is a very high risk of feedback. If any of the, the output that's a thousand times as strong as the input gets back in, then you'll just get feedback. And you probably won't damage the amplifier, but you'll certainly lose your signal under the, under the noise. And so, yeah, you need the coax not only to not have capacitive losses that absorb a high frequency signal, but also not to have emission, which will make its way back in. So, yeah, that's like an $80 cable. Um, uh, a Novena. Unfortunately, I've damaged the screen connector on mine, so I may have to do something a bit clever, but the device is still working fine. Um, not apparent in this photograph, but uh, there's a sort of option socket here 
and the Novena shipped with about four. This is Bunny Huang's open source laptop, for those who are not aware of it. Uh, it shipped with about four different options, and one of them is the field programmable RF unit. And it makes use of the fact that on the motherboard, there's an FPGA, because the, the rate of samples coming off a LIME chip is so high that you can't get it into a USB 3 uh, or even a USB-C connector. You'd need about four. So you've got this very high bandwidth connector available. So how am I for time? When do I finish? Anyone? Come on, 11.30, so I'm off about okay, 20 minutes. Okay, that's fine, good. So uh, here's the difficult math part of the talk. Um, uh, there are four separate ideas that I want to present here. And this is to give a sense of why this thing is difficult to do, even one way. And, and then sort of in your head, you can work out what happens if you double the, the distance. It gets worse. So this first table. Uh, describes the amount of power, the amount of signal power available at each step between the LRO and the analog to digital converter inside the, the chip in the, in the laptop. The transmitter is operating at about 5 watts, or in scientific notation, for reasons that will become obvious, we're crossing 22 orders of magnitude here, so the numbers get tiny, uh, uh, 5 by 10 to the 0. Uh, to make their lives easier, radio engineers use decibels, and usually decibels of uh, milliwatts. The reason is, instead of doing a lot of multiplication, it becomes addition and subtraction. All the powers of two we're accustomed to become multiples of three. So a doubling is add three, or halving is subtract three. Multiply by 16, add 12. Or divide by 16, subtract 12. And so for radio engineers, it's all gain in decibels, and therefore an actual power level in decibel milliwatts. However, very few people in this room are accustomed to thinking this way. So here are the same numbers in scientific notation, notation and then metric. So uh, the transmitter on the satellite is operating about 5 watts. It has a 75 centimeter dish antenna, which delivers about 22 decibels. Uh, it's about 200 fold, 160 fold gain, effective gain. So instead of, in, instead of radiating uniformly, it packs it into 160th of the sky. And so the effective isotropic isotropic means all directions, radiated power is 790 watts. This doesn't change the actual amount of energy that's left the satellite, but because it packs it into one narrow piece, it means we can work with, we can pretend that we've got that larger amount of energy. Um, the big problem is the free space path loss, where we get to lop 21 zeros off the amount of power. So what was 800 watts of effective power is now in the Atto Watt, in fact, not even. It's the Zepto Watt range. Um, there are some even worse problems. Uh, pointing is difficult. In fact, the reason that this project is connected to my satellite tracker is that at some point I will mount the cardboard box on the tracker in order to, to maintain precision pointing to keep the moon right in the middle of the, the field, because there are losses associated with pointing. Um, I've, also, I've guessed here between atmosphere and pointing divide by about four. Um, there are also atmospheric losses. If you're looking at stars in the sky, they twinkle a bit. This is called scintillation. And it's because you've got air between you, at least the first um, 50 kilometers, you've got air. It's moving a little bit. That disrupts the signal a little bit. So between those two, allow five decibels, roughly divide by four. OK. Oh, and finally, polarization. So the, the tracker that I built back at Omega Fair actually had pairs of antennas at right angles. This is to synthesize something called circular polarization. Most radio signals are linear. You've got a simple antenna, straight line, electrons being pushed back and forth, left and right, and so you've got an E field going this way, and therefore the H or magnetic field going this way. That's the basis of, of radio, and most of it's done linear. You can also uh, polarize a signal in a circular way. And so the signal is doing a helix. It's, it's going in circles. The simplest way to do it is to have an antenna that is itself a helix and point it in the direction you're, you're pointing. And so as the electrons are moved up and down the, the wire antenna, you're creating a magnetic, a first thing, electric field that's in a helix, and then 90 degrees behind it, a magnetic field that's in, it, that's in a helix. This turns out to be really useful for satellites because it means you only have to get the pointing right. You don't have to align polarization. If you've got two linear antennas, if you're on Earth, you've got a TV and a TV station, then OK, that's really easy. But if you've got a satellite of an unknown orientation and you've got an antenna on the Earth, it's not enough to point them at each other. You've also got to get them 
into the same polarization or you're throwing away 99.9% .9 of your signal. So helical is rec frequently used in satellite comms because it means that once you've solved the pointing problem, you don't have to solve the polarization problem. The difficulty is, and th because I'm using a horn here, horns can only do linear. So I'm getting away from the need to make a curve, and in, in both the technical problem and the regulatory problem, but what I'm getting back is I can only operate linear. And what that means is, and only one linear can't be polarized two ways. So for the, for the satellite tracker I did for Makerfair, it's two antennas, and there's a way to mix them. In this case, I can only do it one way, which means I lose 50% of my signal. So I go from 2 by 10 to the minus 19 watts, once I've taken into account atmosphere and pointing problems, to 1. This is a tenth of an attowatt. In SI, that's called a zeptowatt, which means basically nothing to anyone. Uh, in metric, you're allowed to concatenate prefixes. So to help make some sense of this, what I'm talking about is 0.1 nano nano watts, a tenth of a billionth of a billionth of a watt. And this is not notional. This is an actual amount of power that's available for, uh, for processing. So we're not, it, it's a ludicrously small amount of power. So OK, how do we get from this to a usable signal? The first is the cardboard box. The cardboard box has a forward gain of about 20 dB or 100 fold. So that gets us from a tenth of an attowatt to 10 attowatts. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> We've gone from almost nothing to a little bit less than, a little bit more. Um, the next is the low noise amplifier. It adds about a thousand fold gain, 30, 30 dB, which gets us up into the, the femtowatt range. Uh, unfortunately, we then have some problems. Uh, the coax, despite being very fancy, will still lose uh, about 30% of the energy that gets passed to it. There's also coupling inside the novena between the, the coax and the line microsystems chip. I'm guessing another decibel there. It might be actually two or three. So what's presented, so in, inside the, uh, the field programmable RF chip, the line chip, are these four amplifiers that, are, that process the signal in sequence. So at the time that we enter the chip, we are at about 5.6 femtowatts. This is still a ludicrously very tiny signal. Uh, fortunately, there's a lot of gain available inside the chip. There's firstly a low noise amp stage, which introduces about 12 decibels or 16 fold amplification. There's then a variable uh, amplifier for up to 1,000 fold. There's then a low pass filter for getting rid of a lot of noise. There's then another variable amp with another 1,000 fold. So at this point, we're up, we're steaming. We've reached 350 nanowatts, a third of a microwatt. Is this enough? Hard to say. So inside the chip, the ADC is it's differential, and it works on about a one volt peak to peak basis. It's a 12 volt ADC, 12 bit rather ADC, meaning 4,096 levels, and I believe they're linear, meaning we're looking at about 240 microvolts per step in the input to the ADC. Uh, okay, so how do we get? How do we compare these things? The input to the ADC has an impedance of about 2 kilo ohms. So you multiply these two numbers together and take the square root. And that gives you a voltage of about 27 millivolts, which is almost 100, in fact, yeah, just over 100 times the step size. So the answer is yes. Assuming that my numbers are right, and there's an awful lot of guesswork in here, so they might not be. But assuming that they're right, then this stuff altogether is enough and just enough to allow the ADC inside the front end chip to actually discern the signal that's arriving from LRO. So sort of we can almost celebrate, except we have a problem. There's always a problem. The problem here is noise. So um, this is a much lengthier discussion, so I'm going to sort of gloss over it a bit. The entire sky outside of Earth, so the entire universe, is emitting radiation, called heat, uh, at a very low level, about 3.7 degrees Kelvin or minus 269 Celsius. But it's not zero. And for numbers this tiny, or this tiny, this tiny amount of heat actually matters. Uh, worse, the moon is not at that temperature. The moon varies between a couple of hundred below freezing and a couple of hundred above freezing. For the purposes of this, I've assumed uh, about minus 25 Celsius, which is, which is somewhere in the middle, or 250 Kelvin. Uh, 
and that the moon is occupying only part of the, the field that the, the box is looking at. So we, it is as though we were inside a sphere at 23 degrees Kelvin, minus 250 Celsius. We multiply this by something called Boltzmann's constant, which is very close to Avogadro's number, for those who remember the chemistry. Um, and we end up with something called the noise power spectral density, which is measured in watts per hertz, or joules, in fact. And the difficulty here is um, the amount of noise power you take in is a function of how wide a bandwidth you're listening to. If you're listening to a channel that's one hertz wide, then you'll get you know, 10 to the minus 22 joules of energy per second. If you're taking a channel that in this case is 5 megahertz wide, you'll get about 10 to the minus 15 watts of noise. That's an incredibly tiny number, except that it's about 10,000 times this number. So now we have a problem. That at, at a first approximation, if you don't have the antenna, what you're receiving in noise alone is 10,000 times what's coming from the satellite. And that's, only, and that's within the passband that you care about. That's hopeless. There's absolutely no way to recover that signal. So you then add an antenna, and this helps us. Oh, sorry, you, it actually gets a bit worse because of the polarization problem, but that's fine. Add the antenna. And the gain in the antenna, we get to count twice. I think I've got this right. Firstly, it strengthens the apparent signal coming from uh, the satellite because it widens the aperture. The aperture for a bit of for, for paper clip is tiny. The aperture for a cardboard box is about 100 times that. So the amount of signal power that's entering and, and being guided into the, the front end of the low noise amplifier is about increased by about 100 fold by having the box there. This is the basis of an amplifier or of a sort of a cone that you're hearing with or whatever. It's the same idea. But additionally, it narrows the beam. So the fraction of the sky that we're receiving noise power from is dropping at the same time. So we get to count the gain twice. Not perfectly. Unfortunately, hidden in here is an assumption about the antenna gain. So I'm afraid my spreadsheet isn't quite right. And so the numbers are slightly exaggerated. But so these are all added, except here. Here we subtract. These are these, are these numbers here. But it's, we're, we're subtracting in this case because the box is simultaneously increasing the amount of energy received from the satellite and reducing the total amount of noise power that's entering. And so we step from this hopeless signal-to-noise ratio of 1 in 10,000, which we have absolutely no hope of decoding, to 1.26. So for every say, watt of total energy coming into the box, we're getting about 600 milliwatts of signal and about 400 milliwatts of noise. That is just barely decodable. It's just enough. And this works because of this double effect of the antenna game. Um, the next few steps are fairly uh, unexciting, except for something called noise factor. And this is a problem for all amplifiers, but especially for low noise amplifiers. Nothing an amplifier can do can reduce the amount of noise. If you've got a signal that contains one watt of, uh, sorry, nine watts of signal and, and one watt of noise, signal to noise ratio of nine to one, then no matter what your amplifier does, your output can't have a better signal to noise ratio because any amplification it performs will amplify both the signal and the noise. But worse than that, most amplifiers will introduce noise themselves. That's called noise factor. And I won't, that's a whole lecture by itself, but it adds noise without adding gain. And so I sort of scoured the world to find someone who can do a 30 dB microwave preamp with a very small noise factor. And to get a sense of how small that is, compare it with the low noise amp on board the radio chip. This only provides 12 dB or 16 fold gain, and yet it quadruples the noise. And that's typical. To go and find an amp that could provide a thousand-fold gain and add only 10, 20% to the noise is a big deal. It's also an expensive device. <laughs> it's a, like five, six hundred dollar device once it's landed in Singapore. So I raise this to make the point that it's not enough that we can resolve the, uh, the signal. And it's not enough that we've solved the sky noise. We've also got to deal with system noise, noise introduced by the components in the signal chain. And in this case, although the very expensive preamp only slightly changed, slightly worsened the signal to noise ratio, the one built into the radio chip quadrupled the noise. And on these numbers, 
it drops that signal to noise ratio from 1.12, which we probably can decode, to 0.32. That is, the noise is three times as big as the signal, which we can't decode. So at this point, we're like, OK, we give up and go home. Not quite. <laughs> there are at least two interesting strategies to pursue here. The first is, let's go and get a dish. Increase for all 29 to keep the number simple. So let's go from 100 fold to 800 fold. Suddenly, our signal to noise ratio is looking much healthier, even despite the amount of noise gratuitously added by the, the low noise amp in the radio chip. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, uh, dishes are a problem in this country. And the other strategy of using uh, what in this case would be eight boxes uh, is complicated for reasons I'll get to the end. Mostly it's expensive, but there's another problem. So the other solution is the bandwidth. Rather than trying to land the entire 5 megahertz wide signal that the satellite is sending, we lower our sights a little and only take 1 megahertz. This doesn't affect, actually it does, but I haven't shown it, it doesn't badly affect, it allows us to detect the signal. It's not wide enough to allow us to demodulate it. It's like standing outside the, a door of a nightclub. We can hear ns, 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 but we can't hear the, the lyrics and we can't hear the, the melody. So it's that problem. We've narrowed what we can hear. But at the same time, we've narrowed how much noise we're bringing in. And so it, it gets our signal to noise ratio back above one. So we have a reasonable chance of detecting the signal. And so that's the point of the experiment. I'm not trying to demodulate, receive, and decode NASA's, in this case, it's not even the mission data, it's the telemetry tracking and control data. All I'm trying to do is detect the signal from the satellite and also measure its Doppler. So it's coming around the moon. As it comes towards us, its signal is raised. As it goes across, it's about the transmitted frequency. And as it goes away, it's, it's lowered. So what I'm hoping to be able to do, if this succeeds, is detect that the signal suddenly appears when LRO appears in front of the moon. And we, the timing's public. That its frequency slowly drops, and then that it disappears when it's supposed to go behind the moon again. So that's, what, that's the expected outcome of the experiment. Bit tight for time. OK. Um, but yeah, not, not trying to demodul demodulate, let alone decode or receive. So where am I? I've got the coax has arrived. Uh, the low noise amp is theoretically in Singapore, in DHL's holding somewhere. So I should have it in the next few days. Uh, my novena is working, except that I damaged the screen cable. So there's a bit of fiddling there. Um, and I will shortly procure a cardboard box. Um, additional approaches. So I mentioned that I'm not using a down converter at this point. I'm starting with the sort of the purest, do a very low noise amp. However, uh, adding a down converter adds another thousand fold gain, but also simplifies the, the coax and the losses in the front end of the radio. So this is a user more conventional convert from two gig to 300 megahertz type uh, approach, which means one more device in the chain, but drastically simplifies the link budget. Uh, and the other is to use a much more spe sensitive spectrum analyzer. Get a lab instrument. These are expensive. They have to be paid money for and rented, and they can't be moved usually, which is fine. I can just point, stick the box out the window and point at the moon. But I have to go and rent time in a lab somewhere to do it. But it's, it's certainly an option. Um, the other, I mentioned long-term averaging. Because I have knowledge in advance of the behavior of the satellite, I can, in principle, take signals over a long period of time. So even with like a 0.3 signal to noise ratio, I could in principle detect bias. It's not going to be perfectly uniform noise because I know something about the behavior of the satellite. So take several minutes data and sum it. And I can perhaps argue that successfully that we're seeing data that's consistent with transmissions from the satellite without actually being able to detect it in the usual way. Um, however, if uh, if both of those fail, then sure. <laughs> so, and this is two options, really. One is to go to a three, three four, five minute dish, which means I've got to go through all the regulatory hurdles. The other is an array of boxes, which I won't do, uh, because two problems. One, mixing is difficult. You have problems with the phase relationship between the boxes, and you introduce a lot of noise in the mixer. But two, you need a preamp per box. So I switched to sort of eight cardboard boxes, uh, I'm looking at about $5,000 worth of preamps. I didn't mind buying one, because it will have application in future projects, but I'm not going to buy eight. <laughs> so uh, yeah, hopefully it doesn't come to this. Um, 
right on target. Right, brilliant. Uh, questions? Brian. Say again? Before you preamp, because uh, if you have a lot of uh, noisy signal, if you average them, the noise will drop. So, but you've got to run. How are you going to get it from the horn to the preamp? So you need we need to preamp preamp before you mix them. There's no there's no transmission line. The preamp's input SMA connector is actually in the throat of the the horn with a paperclip stuck in it. If you want to mix, you've got to put bits of coax, and every one of those induces loss. And you're dealing with zepto watts. <laughs> I've got, you know, you, you'll, what you gain in the multiple boxes, you'll actually potentially lose uh, in the distribution network. Let alone the noise that a mixer will introduce. Well, how much is the uh, so I think it's five, landed. I expect five hundred and sixty-six dollars. Yeah, so you know, just one. <laughs> Forgot about one more question. Sure. Yeah. We're we'll taking like couple questions. So. Okay. So what, what do you expect to get from the signal? Just the carrier. Because I've got to narrow the bandwidth to the point where I can no longer even demodulate the signal, let alone attempt to decode its contents. It really is just either the signal's there or it's not. And I know it's approximate frequency, so I'm looking for you sort of nothing, a signal, nothing. There's no, there's no way to, to even demodulate the signal. But further, as far as I know, NASA is not publishing information about the content. So I would, not a position to decode it. So, uh, there's another one here somewhere? Yep. Yeah. I guess since uh, using a cardboard box and trying to listen to the room um, is relatively near, um, you don't have to be very accurate about where you're pointing the cardboard box? Uh, it's field of view is about 15 degrees. So, it's, yeah, there's a fair bit of play, but clearly the, the pattern is a curve. Uh, the closer to the center of the horn the moon is, uh, the better. So um, you also mentioned uh, other projects like the IC3 uh, satellite. So um, those are far further away. So um, if you're and someone involved transmitting a signal to them rather than reading. So um, I guess there's a huge amount of angular accuracy required. Yeah. So um, any idea of how accurate it needs to be? And yeah, so in the Aris Cyber case, it's, it's a 300 meter dish. Uh, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but I imagine it's like hundreds of a degree. Um, and so they cheat a bit because they can't steer the dish. The dish is stuck. And the Chinese one that just started operating is 500 meters. It's also stuck. They just wait for the Earth to point in the right position. But what you can do, you've got a bit of wiggle room at the focus. And so, yeah, they've got a sort of very high precision way of controlling uh, the beam between the, the focus and the dish in order to track. But yeah, to cover the distances that they covered initially, it's f fractions of a degree. And yeah, I'm never likely to build equipment that accurate. Sure. Yeah. So you talked a lot about satellites at the beginning, right? And uh, a lot of them are funded, well funded by governments. Do you know of any, because it's hair radio, right? So do you know of any satellites that are not government funded? Uh, I haven't done a sort of exhaustive study, but there's, it's generally a mix. So the, right, go back to Oscar 1. The device itself was built by amateurs in a garage and paid for by the people who built it. How did but you the, do that? Beyond hmm? the exosphere, because you have mini rockets, rockets. they've got a free ride on a CIA rocket. <laughs> Seriously, uh, so it was it, it, like engineers who work who were so so. There's it's a project called Corona, and it's NASA's most successful project ever. It was 130 something launches and 130 recoveries, and this is recovery in flight. So you got a, a film canister falling through the atmosphere with a parachute, and a supersonic aircraft that intercepts, catches it. Right. So this was, but this was a vitally important intelligence function at the height of the Cold War. And so, yeah, like whatever they needed to spend, they spend. And that's where most of uh, NASA's money was coming from. But uh, the, the satellite is a, the, the, the cameras are a payload at the top of a, a rocket. It must be actually symmetrical. Otherwise, the rocket engines can't keep the rocket straight. And so you add ballast. And so they're able to say, oh, well, instead of just putting in your rocks, how about uh, this, this satellite? This, this, sorry, this transponder. And so that was the deal. They were able to, to, because they were the right guys, they were doing the engineering work for NASA and NASA contractors anyway, and they were hams, they were able to sort of make the argument that, hey, how about this as a ballast? And therefore, they were able to get their ride for free. Right. They still had to deal with pointing and power, and that's a complicated problem. And so there's never been a success yet in getting to geostationary, but there are two projects that are likely to go into geostationary in 2018, and both of them are riding on the back of commercial satellites. So that the the ride, the pointing, the power is provided by others. The amateurs are only providing the, 
the repeater. Bizarrely, one of them's the US, no big surprise, the other one's Qatar. Somehow, the amateur club of Qatar was able to persuade QTEL to carry an, a ham transponder into geostationary. And that's, that's due for January, February uh, 2018. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. But if you have further questions, you can always look for Roland over lunch or break because you mean he doesn't want to run away from you at that point. I'll be around. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Roland.